bad, so thank you very much, Facebook. Good afternoon, <laughs> good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us on Hack Mankind today. Uh, today, my panelist, uh, friend, brother, um, and general all-round awesome dude that was with me is Sean Caggy. Sean, good to see you. Peter, great to see you, and thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks. So I was... Um, Privileged enough to be on the unblinded huddle um, earlier on. And if anybody doesn't know what this is, we'll tell you at the end because it's something you should be on as well. Um, it's one of the few things that literally has a recurring reminder in my, uh, in my diary. And there were two awesome people on from functional medicine and they were talking to us about, you know, food in your gut, etc. And Sean, you neatly sidestepped the fact that anybody that knows you knows you eat like trash, right? <laughs> I mean, so how, how are you going to sit with integrity and host the real role with these two guys later on when you, I think it's what, I mean, pot noodles, like frankfurters, do you know what broccoli is or how are you going to do this? I heard of broccoli once. So yes, um, I would, I would defend myself and I've had this debate with uh, many friends, uh, including Chris Crone, Rob Gill, Michael Smiken, et cetera. Um, and so here, here's my thing. Yes, my I have a suboptimal diet for sure on the scale of suboptimal. <laughs> on on the scale of Peter Osborne and Dr. Um, Patel, Sachin Patel, I would I would imagine my diet would be like a two on a scale of one to ten. Against the average American diet, I would put mine probably at a seven point five. So as we know, I don't want to be a seven point five, and it's wildly suboptimal. But uh, yes, in my integrity, um, when I think about the putrefied, rotting gut that I have right now, based on the Twizzlers I had last evening and some of the Oreos, vanilla Oreos though, um, Peter, Easter oh, vanilla Oreos. So I think they're good. better, right? Easter vanilla Oreos. Um, yes, I will be, it, it had an impact for real this morning, but we are here to talk about business acceleration and I did work out. So if I look at my overall health quadrants, um, I do feel pretty strongly about my health quadrant, I would move it more into like a nine to a 9.2 overall because of the other things that I do. I stay super hydrated. I work out a ton um, and I control my nervous system functioning, I think in a quite masterful way. But yes, uh, my definitely suboptimal is that. And I will let them bang me over the head and hit me with a lightning bolt. So I remain completely in integrity. And I'm that's super nice. excited to have them on today. But that's that's a, yeah. a friend of mine in that space once told me that Obviously, you should look after everything, but if you were to look, you know, be really well on your hydration, really well on your sleep, um, not live in a place of stress, exercise, then you can actually let the food one slide. They literally said, if you can, if you do four out of five, and it's literally any of the four of five, then your body can keep up. It, it might not like grow and heal, but it can keep up. Um, which I, I don't know if that was just him making me feel better for the fact that I choose to sleep four hours a night. Um, <laughs> but yeah, hey, you know, that's, that's the, all that is. So you've actually moved location, which confounded my prep time, but we're going to roll with it anyway. A lot of people with us last week uh, reached out to me and they were touched. They were privileged. There were so many beautiful phrases that we used. I can't even encapsulate them when you're talking through your wall. Um, and we saw the the Miracle on Ice, which I, I have now, when I, my wife watched it as well, she's like, you've got to go and watch that film. How can you not know about this? And I'm like, because I'm a Brit. And she's like, it's no excuse. Go and watch it. I'm like, okay. And then um, obviously you shared the story around your uncle and the skis. And we said we were going to talk about the other thing that really meant something to you on the wall, which I think is actually out of the camera shot. Um, and it's uh, some memorabilia from Muhammad yeah. Ali. Yeah, I am in a different physical location, meaning that wall is uh, about two hours drive from where I am. Yeah, the wall still exists, everybody. Don't be worried. You know, yeah. It's not that we've lost the wall. <laughs> it still technically exists. It's just not with us in, in the camera. Um, so tell us about Muhammad Ali. And what's the memorabilia there? And what does it mean to you? I tell you what, though, Peter. What will be deeply meaningful for me, for mindset motivation, is if next week I will put a wall behind me that means even more than that wall. And we can wow. see that a hair today. It means even more than that wall. So... Uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, in the nutshell. So for those that um, are unfamiliar with Muhammad Ali, beyond the fact that he was a, a boxer, many would call him the most influential athlete in history. And when Michael Jordan was playing, 
um, at the height of his career, I was deeply frustrated that he was on listed on ESPN's top 100 influencing athletes of all time as number one in Muhammad Ali, number two, Babe Ruth, number three, I left. And of course that would have changed now because he was just popular at the time. Muhammad Ali transcended uh, sport um, and was arguably the most recognizable figure on the planet at one point. And what he did was, and, and I don't know that I, uh, I'm not commenting on whether I agree, disagree in part or in whole with what he did, but here's what I do agree with. I agree that he stood for what he believed in and the cost was incalculable that he was never able to recapture. So Muhammad Ali decided that he disagreed with the Vietnam War and was inconsistent with his religious beliefs and he refused induction. Now, many could say, well, he was afraid it was a publicity stunt, au contraire, because Muhammad Ali would have been permitted to go in and simply box exhibition, exhibition matches as a part of the military. So he refused. And again, sharpen your listening, folks, in case you're hearing me say, I agree that that was the right thing for him to do. I'm not saying if I do or don't or how much I do or don't. What I'm saying is he authentically believed it because he could have had it easy. He could have had it easy. And what he lost because he st stepped into what he believed in is he lost the most th the three and a half most valuable years of the prime of his boxing career three and a half years. And he was champion. He was stripped of his title. He became financially broke. He had people that he uh, trusted that believed in him and quite frankly, were aligned with his religious beliefs that weren't supporting him. And, and in my estimation, now I will step in with a little bit of my own assessment of the behavior. Uh, I find it beyond coincidental that at the time he lost his title, he lost his money for the religious belief that they claimed to love him for, they abandoned him substantially as well. So this man that was the most iconic figure on the planet literally lost the support of all the people closest to him as faith while standing up for the faith that he believed in. Uh, and when I say lost, meaning I, they weren't financially supporting him, he wasn't nearly as prominently featured in presence. I don't mean that they like, literally ostracized him and disagreed with his decision, lost his title and lost everything that he had virtually financially, okay? Now, I'm also aware that Muhammad Ali had some interesting behaviors as it related to marriage and infidelity, so I'm not endorsing that component, but I do love and believe at the highest level when people step into what they believe in and they are willing to literally sacrifice everything and for me, that is a penultimate example of mindset and motivation on the one hand. On the second hand, after it was done, he came back and he fought for his title. And he lost to Joe Frazier, who had emerged as the champion when Muhammad Ali had been stripped of his title. And Peter and everyone, that fight was perhaps the most important fight in the history of boxing as it related to the world. Because essentially people lined up on two sides of the equation and my dad was one of those people, right? And I was an infant. So on the one hand was Joe Frazier who stood for uh, what America was recognized to be by let's say the more conservative traditionalists. And on the other side was a space of change, lack refusal to accept racial injustice, um, religious discrimination, um, gender dynamics, you know, the movements of the late 19, mid to late 60s and you know, early 70s. And that's what Muhammad Ali stood for. So that fight for so many people was about positive change, traditionalism, refusing change, Richard Nixon versus truth, all the things that were at play. And Muhammad Ali lost. And so everybody, for everyone that believed, they were devastated. People cried. The young people, the energy, the movement of change, which by the way, I am not fundamentally making better or worse than traditionalists because that movement had all of its own issues. See 1969 in the summer, summer of love, hate Ashbury in San Francisco, and all of a sudden these utilitarian believers, right, 
um, living in parks and robbing each other and being drug addicted and having problems. So I always believe that it's not good or bad 100%. There's optimization dynamics in both sides of any equation. I believe that usually, obviously not like Hitler's Germany, but usually, right? So Muhammad Ali though, and Peter, what, what brings this to why I love him beyond belief is the person who beat him, Joe Frazier, soon thereafter got crushed. I mean, eviscerated in a fight with George Foreman. And if you're like, oh, the guy that sells grills? No, no, no. George Foreman wasn't the guy who sells grills. He was Mike Tyson before there was Mike Tyson. He was the most devastatingly feared boxer on earth. And he knocked out Joe Frazier, who beat Muhammad Ali, and did it in devastating fashion, crushing him. So when Muhammad Ali was going to fight George Foreman in Zaire, in what would become to be called the Rumble in the Jungle, people literally thought Muhammad Ali was going to get killed because he couldn't possibly, he was past his prime. He lost those three and a half years. He had lost to Joe Frazier, who got destroyed by George Foreman. And Peter, why I love Muhammad Ali is because while he lost his athletic peak skills and he was no longer a 9.999 and he was simply maybe a 9.99, George Foreman at his peak and his prime, he created a strategy called the rope dope which he literally invented during the fight in one of the most brilliant strategic innovations for one of the most brilliant people standing for his belief, self-mastery. And he beat George Foreman and knocked him out in the eighth round. And for, to me, it was one of the most iconic moments in somebody's life journey of massive impact and influence in the world, which is why that's on my wall. And I also own Muhammad Ali shaking because for all of those things, he lost his faculties. His brain was beaten and destroyed. And he developed horrendous brain disease. And that's why in 1996, when he lit the Olympic torch in Atlanta as a, a surprise guest, I had tears pouring down my face because of what it stood for. Not saying I agree with everything he did. Not even saying I agree that people should be boxing. But for a man that stood for everything, lost everything, came back against all odds, that to me is an ultimate example of the hero's journey and the formula that I believe in. And thank you for letting me share that. And that's why he's on my wall. Oh, thank you for sharing that. I think that it adds huge amounts of value to everybody. And what I actually take away from it, Sean, it, it, it might not be what, what you're wanting me to take away from it, but I think it's a really relevant fact. Yeah. I've realized as you're talking that one of the things that I think everybody should do um, and our hack of the day today was look at what um, look at what's being said versus what you hear, um, and look at the the filter that you put on things, because often when people are showing you love, it might not be in the way you're expecting to see it, so you might not actually feel it's love. But when you pay attention, you can see it. And why I want to bring that up was if you look, at, if you you don't need to like boxing. You don't even need to respect Muhammad Ali, um, although I would think you're fairly crazy if you're on the list of people that didn't, but you don't even need to like him. You don't need to like George Foreman. You don't need to like any of it because you can extrapolate the meaning out of it and that can become a source of power to you as it is, is to Sean and it is to me. And it's the same with Miracle on Ice. I've never seen it. It's the same with the 66 World Cup. It's the same with the space race. There's anything you look into, there are lessons that you can take away from it. Um, like, you know, Sean is going to interview people and, um, and do a real roar when he at Twizzlers and Oreos, but don't worry because they're vanilla. Um, <laughs> right? There's something to take away from that. Right? There's it's something easier. to take away in all of this. <laughs> you know, you, can you see there's a theme developing on this one, Sean? <laughs> yeah, so I, I, Peter, just to be, clear, to, to be clear, we'll have to deal with this, right? So as you can see, <laughs> they, uh, the, these are Easter Oreos. So this is what we're talking about. So Easter Oreos, they're special Oreos. So you have dispensation for eating them because they are for Easter. Right, is that like the calories don't count if you take it from somebody else's plate? Same kind of thing. Very, same concept, 100%. Got it, right. I understand now, I've got a frame of reference, thank you. Um, and the reason I said this kind of, there's parables and everything is I posted something last night. I, I, I am a, a football fan or American football fan, depending on where we're listening in the globe. 
Um, so I stayed up last night to watch the, the draft. And the draft start, started with a segment from Peyton Manning, um, for those who don't know, one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. Um, uh, debatable. I said one of before anyone starts reacting. One of, not the. Um, and he started the segment about him and hope and how the draft represents hope um, and how the draft is the embodiment of, you know, you've got these, these kids that have bled, sweat, and done everything for the whole of their life to get to this one moment. And it's a reset as well. And I'm literally getting chills thinking about it. If you haven't seen it, go and watch it. It's a reset for the teams, right? Uh, struggling Jets fans like myself and Sean or Bengals fans. It's like, yeah, it's a new season. We're going to do it this season. And every time, as, as certainly as a Jets fan, every time you do it, about six games in, you go, what am I doing? It's still the Jets. doesn't matter. So they got one player. Yeah. But to, I just thought it was a funny parallel. But... Talking of the draft. Can I, can I drop one footnote in there? Yeah, please. please. So uh, my birthday is January 24th. So the Jet 2 AFC championship game, meaning the games the Jets lost to get to the Super Bowl, because they've never uh, won the Super Bowl during my lifetime, never been in the Super Bowl in my lifetime. The two times that they lost in the game that would have taken them to the Super Bowl uh, was either exactly on my birthday I believe my 40th birthday, they lost to Peyton Manning and the Colts when I was in Deer Valley skiing, right? Uh, watching the game with my children. And then I believe they lost the Steelers. I don't think it was on my actual birthday, but the day I was celebrating with my family, my birthday. So the two times to make everything even worse were on my birthdays, including an iconic birthday, your 40th. So what, please, what I heard from that is you're cruel enough to make your kids Jets fans as well. <laughs> yeah. We definitely, and watch the games, so. Oh, yeah. that's just flagellation for the sake of it. Yes. So, the draft, last night. So, for, okay, very quick primer for anybody who doesn't know. Um, American football, um, when kids come through college, they get selected to go into the NFL, and the NFL do picks in order to pull people up into the teams. There's some shenanigans, tra trades and drafts, and where you are at in the draft, the order is based on how, how good you were last season, roughly speaking. There are some caveats to that, but that's the basic model. And I love that as an analogy as well. I love the fact that America, American sports in, infer this fair play back every season and give everybody the ability to reset every season along with salary caps, et cetera, which is something in the UK in soccer we're massively missing because the top four or five teams just, you know, more money, more mastery, more money, more mastery, and up they go. So... Yeah, yeah. In the draft of last night, the Jets hired, uh, selected Mecky Becton. Now, Mecky, for anyone that doesn't know, is a left tackle. Um, so his job is to stop people hurting Sam Darnold, the quarterback. They had other people on the, the table they could have selected, which in pure draft capital were probably better. Um, I'm not an NFL pundit, but there were several wide receivers that are widely respected and, and with kind of a high regard, but they chose a left tackle. So Sean, it's a spurious question because basically I wanted to talk about the Jets. <laughs> but but we, ju I just said, we just talked about parallels in yeah. Muhammad Ali. Where's the parallel here? Where can, what can people take away from that lesson? The better option in quotes or the better draft pick was left on the table and someone chose someone that was specific for that. Yeah. So I think it goes back to like what Herb Brooks said in Miracle on Ice. Um, and I'm not assessing if it was the optimal decision, but the intent was the same. And the intent is who's the best player for our team right now? And what do we need? And so a left tackle protects the team, protects the quarterback, and the Jets uh, have a new quarterback that they, they drafted uh, in the recent past to build a franchise around. Left tackle is the ultimate position because it it protects the backside of the quarterback. So what's present for me, uh, same way that Herb Brooks, uh, you know, amazing in, in Miracle, uh, well, the, the true story, of course, it's all a true story, was that he said, um, you don't have the best players, Herb. You're not picking the best players, Coach Herb Brooks. He said, I don't want the best players. I want the right ones. We're not building an all-star team. We're not just taking the best talent. We're taking the best players for the team so we can win and achieve the mission. And I hope that's what the Jets, the Jets succeeded at doing, but I am confident that is the intention. And I think for all of us, I've made this mistake repeatedly, Peter, repeatedly, 
is I've tried to go out and find um, the most charismatic people, the best people, people of influence, because I'm attracted and, and interested in influence in a huge way. And I've at times erred in overvaluing that, that skill set for what I needed in the team right now. That's a superpower. You hear, you go, what? You say it's a superpower. It is a superpower, but you can't have everybody playing quarterback. So you need folks to play their appropriate position in building your team, your movement, your world. And you know, today we announced that Lorelai is the real raw role play relationship coordinator, for example. Um, and I'm not saying Lorelai certainly doesn't uh, look like a left tackle. She doesn't show up like a left tackle who are typically about 320 pounds and about six foot six. Uh, but Lorelai is a person right now, the talent, the skills, the ability, the passion, like right person right now for critical role in the entire dynamic and advancement of this unblinded movement and the real, real role play, which is its own conversation for a different day. But uh, yeah, I think we just did what the Jets did last night. We got an amazing teammate to play an incredible role and we need lots more teammates to play lots of incredible roles. But yeah, I think that's how, that's how that fits into everything we're talking about in the emergence of sport and team and dynamic. And yeah, that's what's present for me. Amazing. I would say maybe you need to shorten her job title a bit. Left tackle is a little bit more ta catchy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just from now on, we will dub Lorelei the left tackle. They yeah. are. They are. Oh, we had UC last week. We're making Lorelei the left tackle this week, literally shaping the world as we speak. We are. We are. However, there is one caveat, Sean. It's something I know that I'm literally putting you up, you and I on a soapbox here. There's one caveat in that hiring mentality and methodology that you and I regard as kind of sacrosanct. And you know where I'm going with this, it's integrity. I think I, think I do, yeah. Um, I am happy to accept people that don't believe in my religious views, people that aren't of the same race as me, all of that is a given. I'm also happy and welcoming of people with different skill sets to me because it compliments me. And to me, good leaders do exactly that. Um, Jeff Bezos, I love this. He has one question that he asks at the beginning of every interview he does which is, are you the smartest guy you know? And if the guy says no, he says, well, can you forward me the CV for that guy then? Um, so he has this, this ultra filter, and he, his true belief is he should always hire people better than him for the role that you want, right? Because you want to grow the thing, not contract it. You yes. don't want you to be the glass ceiling. Yes. But integrity has to be there. So for anyone that knows me well enough, they know where I'm going as well. So Sean, what did um, the influencer, Uncle G, Grant Cardone, do this week that made me want to bring up this subject? So what I am present to, so I could frame this really quickly. So number one, um, integrity to me means saying what you do and, and doing what you say, right? Um, and it means more than that, but at least means that. And I will start before I start commenting on somebody else's integrity and saying that there are times that I have my own integrity breaches and in not completing and doing what I say, including at times being late. So that's an integrity breach. So before I step on to the, through the, the prism of analyzing somebody else's integrity, I always say I come from a space of imperfect integrity, but I don't lie, cheat, and steal, right? And those are also questions of integrity. So, um, Additionally, I distinguish, I like to distinguish for me, as I said before here, I believe, the difference between um, judging the person and the actions, okay? So with that prism, I was outraged by some of the things that Grant Cardone uh, recently did. And uh, two of them were his team, one sending out um, emails that said, I've got it, okay, which would... People are in a space of caring extraordinarily about Corona. And the implication would be, oh my God, Grant Cardone's got Corona, right? So you open the email and it was like about an idea. So that to me was a wildly distasteful act, wildly distasteful act. Second, and this is I think probably more to what you were suggesting. So on the heels of that, um, Grant Cardone, I get these phone calls everywhere. Oh my God, you hear about Grant Cardone? He's going bankrupt. You got to watch this video. And I watched the video and a lot of people very candidly, Peter, that sent it to me said, 
ha, ha, ha. I said, ha, ha, ha. It's a human being. Like, there's no ha, ha, ha. Like, this is horrible. Like, this guy's but going to sure. It's not even one human being. If Cardone Capital goes bankrupt with 8,000 units, yeah. it's... It's 100,000, 10,000 investors as well that we're talking about. It's not yeah. just necessarily him. Absolutely right. You're right. Thank you for that uh, amplification. So I was like, I'm not happy about that. Are you kidding? Like, this is horrendous. And I had, I had well-known publicists calling me, legit, for comment. I mean, I'm like, of like super famous people calling me and saying, hey, what do you think? You know, like, and I'm like, this is crazy. I can't believe it, you know? And then it comes out that the entire thing was a lie. Like, let's be real, a lie, a lie. Not true, not a funny joke. And there was a space, a meaningful space in time between it going out and confirmation that it wasn't true. So I would find it to be 100% of the, uh, the opposite, right? 180 degrees, 100% opposite, 180 degrees from where I sit in what I believe is the, the approach to value added business integrity. I like having fun. Like we just showed Oreos. I can show you the Twizzlers. Like I like joking. Like I like ribbed and being ribbed and kidding, joking, jostling, all in truth. But I, it was deplorable, deplorable, which um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Turn it back to you for comment. I have more to say, but I want to just check back in with you. I presume that's what you're talking about. Yes. Absolutely. Well, the first thing I want to, you said amplification. The first thing I want to do is actually add, add to it again. Because I think one thing that I think is really relevant is the, the, the I've gone bankrupt is him on video. So this is not an email of his staff. This is not oh, yeah. an, a message in a process. And the I was only joking is him on video. So there is, you, you can't, like with the um, I've got it email, there could have been, which I don't believe to be true, but there could have been a route where somebody comes out and says, you know, somebody sent that, it was totally incorrect, and that person's been removed from the team. Yes. Um, and then you're back in integrity. You screwed up, but you're still yeah. working with integrity. But those two videos, and in the second video, it was actually even the explanation of what he said and why he did it that I then found so abhorrent, it, which kind of boiled down to lying is okay if that's what you have to do to get your media share and your message across in this time. And the reason we're bringing all this in and I, I'm threading all this together yeah. is that's what we're talking about with Muhammad Ali. We're talking about a guy that said, I will not endorse this. I will not go to war. I will not even fight exhibition matches in your war because it's so against what I do, even if it means throwing away the prime of my life. Yes. which for a boxer is a very small window. Yes. Right? That, that was his time. And then we have nowadays, we have Grant Cardone, the 10 Extra, which loads of people follow and listen and absorb what this guy says, is sitting there going, lying's okay. And I'm not even going to say it's my opinion. I'm just going to say, no, it's not. It is not okay. I don't mind his stage antics his camaraderie his you know i've got a petite do you have it i've got a crazy car do you that's all showmanship and it's all okay that's all fine but i watched that and went i can't believe that somebody that has literally people at home that have perhaps lost their job that have invested in his business and the worst thing about it for me and this might sound crazy because this is slightly abstract from the integrity thing. I can't even see the logic behind why you would do it. I can't yeah. see what the win is. Um, and that's why I just, it just, just, it's just vomit inducing. Yeah. So, so thank you, Peter. And, and I agree. And I'm going to demonstrate my integrity. So a great marketing strategy from blinded since we sell sales training and so does uh, Cardone could be to attack him on this and attack him on this, right? That could help. I mean, we could do things. I mean, you're, you're a genius, Peter. I'm sure you could demonstrate to me 50 different ways that I with Unblinded could leverage what he just did and get a lot of people to see my name. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. I won't do it, but here's what I will do, right? I want, and I've been, I put out a video a year ago 
I am staking this. I'll bet a quarter million dollars for charity against Grant Cardone that his sales training, number one, is inferior to mine and we'll debate it for a week, a, an hour, two hours in front of humans, like literally role play, it, like on a real raw, any neutral set of judges. And second, I'll debate what he just did with him in front of anybody. And whoever loses quarter million dollars goes to charity. I'll put the money in an escrow account so it's ready to go. And I bet you he'll never do it. And his reason for never doing it's going to be, oh, that guy's, I'm ahead of him. He just wants to catch up. And the answer is because I would kick his fucking ass. Excuse me for cursing, and I will never curse again. No, we're because okay. Because his stuff is inferior, and you could send that to him. Anybody out there wants to send it, I'll kick his effing A, right? In integrity, because his stuff is garbage comparatively, and that I will stand on and promote. And his behavior was abysmal. And the people following him are going to model not just what he says, but what he does. And he's teaching tens of thousands of people to do the wrong, most horrific things in the sake of getting, getting heard and raising their hand, as opposed to all the integrity-based ways to do that. I apologize for cursing, Peter. That wasn't intended. It just came out. I haven't cursed on the huddles or anything like that. So my apologies. But that's the energy I bring to that. And I want him to know, because I believe in Muhammad Ali. I believe in calling it like it is. So let's get in the ring and let's have a fight. Let's get in the ring and have a fight. And then you could ask me if I have a watch. I could have a watch like that if I wanted to buy one. I could have a plane if I wanted to have a plane. I didn't want to. I'm going to coach a thousand of my kids' games. But my stuff is better than your stuff. Flag on the ground. Let's go, dude. Uh, well, I'm going to literally take it as my personal mission to get that message to him now. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. I love it. it and, yeah. and that wasn't staged. Peter and I didn't say that. That was not staged. Peter and I, you did not know I was going to say any of that. Is that fair? Well, the only thing that was discussed before this was I said, I would like to discuss Grant Cardone. Are you okay with that? That was it. I said yes. Because normally I would want to stay in a place of positivity. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I actually want to say something else to this, to the last bit. is There is another theory, and I, I am so conflicted in which one I hope is true. So theory one is what we've seen. He said this, he came out and said, I'm lying. Um, if, you, if you want to see more about this in a bit more depth, Chris Crone did an amazing video, a friend of Sean and I's. Um, it's on YouTube. If you yeah. search for Chris Crone, well, well, you'll see well, a great well, video. Well. Um, and I love his video. I, Chris, actually, I, I don't like you. You're good looking, you're intelligent, you're smart, your video work is great. You know, you're ugh. Um, but anyway, that's theory one. Theory one is that what we've seen is true, that he deliberately trolled himself to get the message, to get stage time. Theory two hmm. is that he is actually going bankrupt and the bank reached out to him afterwards and said, you've just devalued all the assets we're about to buy. You need to undo this however you can. Hmm. And in, I, I'm literally conflicted. Uh, half of me wants it to not be true that he thought that was a good idea but that means that I'm hoping that he is bankrupt. And the other half of me would say, I really don't want him to be bankrupt because there's 10,000 people that have, you know, part of Cardone Capital, but then I have to acknowledge that he did what he did. Yeah. It's a, it's a weird choice. Yeah, so, so for me, Peter, here's where I sit. With all the things I just said, I want Grant Cardone to be happy. I want him not to be bankrupt. I want him to be healthy and I want him to see that what he did is not serving the world. He has the superpower of influence. He's built a structure around him, right? Those are amazing and incredible things. He has a duty in my mind and a responsibility as a citizen of the world to do things that are right with it. And I get it that people make mistakes. I've made plenty of mistakes. But to do that in this time and use that this way is just a, a ridiculous act. So I don't wish him any ill. I never wish anybody any ill, but I like revealing truth. All I want to do is I want to get in the track and I'm saying, you think you're you know, the fastest man on earth, Grant. Um, I want to race you. I'm going to blow you away like Usain Bolt blew away the world champion before and let's just let, let's do it. Like I like athletics. I like competition. I like fairness. That's the kind of thing I would have said in the locker room before a game. We're going to kick their F and A. Let's go. Like let's compete. 
and the competition isn't your watch. It's not a plane, right? It's you in front of people teaching other people. Not that you have an innate ability to influence people, overpower them and sell. Can you teach it? Is it replicatable? Do you understand why? Not because you have 99 closing lines. And the idea that you even use closing lines to me is negative vibrational. Why most people can't sell in the first place is they, they feel disgusting by doing it. And Grant, you just amplified that, brother. You just amplified it. And let's come have a conversation. You think you could talk over people? Brother, you won't talk over me. So I stand on the side of truth and integrity in selling and marketing in the space of acceleration. Let's have, a, let's have fun and let's wake you up, Grant. Let's wake you up. So thank you. I'll stop. Well, do you know I have a, 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 a submission, Sean, whenever you and I talk, is to try and take you to spaces that you're not normally in. I think I've achieved that today. <laughs> well, if you, um, so it's funny because some of the people that know me best are saying, you know, you got to make sure you show people what true Zeus energy inside of you looks like, you know, and, and that fire. And that's the fire I played sports with. That's the fire I led with in the locker room, right? In integrity, never cheating. I never, I was never a dirty player. I never fouled people if the ref wasn't looking. And my kids, I mean, my daughter, when she was not in, in ninth grade, she got cheap shotted by a player in the field and in front of probably, you know, it was a preseason game, maybe three, 400 people in the stands. I yelled out, she's a freshman you know, playing for us, they like, Courtney, next time, knock her on her ass and scream that like in front of everybody. And the dad yelled something. I'm like, my daughter's going to knock your daughter on her ass as she pulls that. <laughs> like, and that's just like, like if we don't stand up with fire in the face of wrongdoing, like who's going to? And so that's a part of what I believe in. So thank you for taking me there today. You mentioned um, Nazi Germany earlier. And obviously that is never somewhere we should probably go. But the phrase that I always remember when, whenever that word combination is presented with me is for evil to prosper, the good just need to do nothing. Um, that's what it reminds me of. And I guess that's what we're seeing here. Um, so I'm going to sidestep slightly. Um, we yes. have one last subject um, and then we'll do some final thoughts um, because I've got, we've got to make sure we wrap up because my members only uh, hack review is in 11 minutes. So, mm. Sean, uh, Hat Mankind, as you know, we have a theme every week. So this week was hope, um, mm -hmm. which was wonderful when Peyton did that video. I'm like, that's a gift. Thank you very much. Next week is choices. So when I say choices, what comes to your mind? How we perceive everything. Perception. So choices are, I could have chosen to be politically correct and respond to Grant Cardone, and I wouldn't have served the people here. I could have chosen to want to please everyone and make sure I was not potentially ruffling a feather and remain silent. I could have chosen, uh, once I gained a certain level of financial freedom and abundance, to spend my time indulging myself or to build companies and try to impact chains. I could choose to let the people that work for me behave suboptimally or uh, because well, it's a certain time and people are worried and distracted, or I could lead them like Herb Brooks would have led the team on Miracle. So choice to me begins with confronting ourself. That's where it begins. And choice begins how we process all information, how we process our feelings and our thoughts and what causes them. And I think we could choose all of it. So I think choice is the, the ultimate power. It's where it all begins. So that's what I would share initially about choice. I think that's beautiful. Stay tuned more for next week. We'll have a daily hack every day next week and challenges in hackmankind.com. Um, so, Sean, wow, I, I'm slightly bowled over. I think this has been a fantastic uh, session. I hope people are getting, you know, we are trying to phrase this around mindset and mentality, and I do appreciate we're maybe making you work to see it. Um, but here's what we've kind of discussed as a, as a rough overview. We've discussed the fact that Muhammad Ali is willing to, was willing to give up everything to stay in his space. We've discussed the fact that Sean likes vanilla Oreos, and if they're Easter Oreos, it's perfectly acceptable, unlike normal Oreos. And I do that as a reference to Tia, who types in the comments as well. We've discussed the fact that in both your business, your families, your friendships, yourself, it's not always about getting the best. It's about getting what's right for you. And that can change on a daily basis, and that's what the Jets did in the draft. 
We discussed the fact that Sean and I would, if literally if I had to go to my grave and there's only one lesson I could give everybody, it's integrity. It's integrity, integrity. And if you master integrity, then work on authenticity. They, they are different. Integrity is the multiplier of authenticity. But those two things are the things, they're the things that everybody will remember about you. When you're long and gone, the integrity and authenticity is literally, in my opinion, it's all you have. Um, so they're the things I push to people. Um, and we discussed the power of choices. So I think that's been, uh, we made you work for it, but I hope you enjoyed it. Um, Sean, final thoughts, and then I'll uh, wrap up. And the real raw, I mean, it's, it's on fire. You had Joseph McClendon and Scott Harris the other night. Uh, we had Joseph McClendon and Chris Cardone. We're going to get Scott back on. Uh, he was uh, out at sea in Australia, so some dynamics there, but some incredible people right. on every day. Yeah, on fire. Final, final thought. Um, it's 1987. It is about 30 degrees below zero with the wind chill factor. And I'm on a high school football field with my brothers and best friends. And we had a dream of winning a state championship. And we were one game from doing it. And we were down 10-6 in the fourth quarter. And it was fourth and four. And the other team has the ball. And I'm playing cornerback. And I played a great game defensively. They didn't gain any yards around my end. And I'm crushing it. So this is it, right? This is it. And this is what... If you've ever seen the movie Friday Night Lights, since we were little kids, we had dreamed about and grown up. Like this was life, the most important thing imaginable. The ball is snapped, the play begins, a blocker comes out on me, and I give significant, meaningful effort, and the ball carry gets five yards, it's a first down, and the game is over. I look back on that moment often and think, that I was out of integrity. And I was into out of integrity because my choice in that moment wasn't to go to a 9.9999999, if not a 10, as if my life depended on it. And in ref upon reflection, I don't even know why. I don't even know why. But if I could leave you with anything, it's to make sure before each action you're taking, you're processing your day, you're making those choices, is to put yourself in a peak state and level of action at 9.999 because that was 33 years ago and I still remember that moment. And while I caught the winning touchdown a week later on fourth and goal from the 20 to win the league championship for my team or with my team, I still remember that moment and how I let my team and myself down. So that's what integrity is in choices. Peter, I'm honored to have these conversations every week because I'm talking about a lot of other stuff regularly, and this is a beautiful and incredible space to share, and, and I'm very grateful for everybody listening. I apologize for dropping an F-bomb, and I also thank you, brother. Thank you, Sean. And so just to, to give that last sense from Sean, um, just a, a little bit more pep. Um, I cannot remember who said this, but I've, I don't think I know of anything more true. You will always regret the things you don't do more than the things you do. So step up. Simple as that. Um, so you've listened to Peter Swain and Sean Callagy. Uh, Callagy sorry. Um, please join us on www.hatmankind.com. Our first, time, first thousand members are free. Um, and then we'll be looking to charge for the, for the remainders that didn't make that lucky break. Uh, everything we do for first-time responders will always be free. So doctors, nurses, teachers, EMTs, police officers and firefighters, for myself and Sean and everyone at Mankind and everybody at Unblinded, thank you for everything that you're doing for us. Your sacrifice is noted, welcomed, and we couldn't be more grateful. Um, and then, Sean, it's the unblindedhuddle.com, I believe. Yes, sir. Every day, 8.30 in Eastern time, holding a flag in the ground, greatest way to start your day. No matter where you're on the world, you can always listen to a replay get you going for the day and uh, having incredible people on. And Peter, we got to get you on the real raw soon. So thank as, you. As I said, as soon as you find someone for me to step up against, I'll do it. <laughs> right. Thank you, man. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. Bye-bye.